right. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah chapter 10. Let's see, I might be able to stand. Let me do this. That'll work. Ah. Okay. Uh, so, from last week, the, we saw an example last week of the ancient liturgy of uh, the children of Israel singing their confession and hearing God's word and reciting the grace and goodness of God on the one hand while confessing their sins on the other. And it was, it was an interesting example, both of ancient liturgy and how they used to, to worship, but also a, a, a very helpful model just for confession and forgiveness, generally speaking, that their confession hid nothing, didn't try and hide behind anyone. It was very honest, and they owned their sin. But when it came to grace, <clears throat> they also, <coughs> excuse me, owned God's grace. They received it fully, um, vested themselves in it, had, uh, had no doubts, didn't let their sin rob them of grace. So we went through this whole process last time. Then at the very end, if you remember from last chapter we looked at, they, they all wrote out this covenant and it said the leaders of our Levites, a priest, uh, our priests sealed it. And now verse 10, that's how it picks up. Now those who placed their seal on the document were. So this is, these are the names now of everybody who actually affixed their names to this new covenant that they were making with God. They were, it, was a, it was a restoration thing where their forefathers had failed God's ancient covenant. Now they're going to pledge themselves anew to it. And not just verbally, but you know, at another level by actually writing their names in it, making it a legally binding document. So on the handout here, Nehemiah is the first to sign because he leads all the people and sets the example, as he has been doing throughout this book. He's always the point of the spear. Uh, so here too. Then follow the priests, the Levites, and the nobles. Uh, the religious leaders precede the political leaders because their role is more important than mere social governance. It also shows how Israel is focused on putting God first here. Um, so, yeah, you get in verses 2 through 8 are the lists of the priests that follow Nehemiah. Uh, verse 8, it says, these were the priests. And then nine, now you get a list of all the Levites that signed this document. Uh, Levites were also you know, church workers. Uh, they, they, they were responsible for all the various duties throughout the, the, the temple. The priests offered the sacrifices. The Levites did most everything else. Um, on the handout again, 15 of the priests' names are found in chapter 12, 2 through 7, listed as chiefs of priests who came up with Ezra and Zerubbabel. So, uh, and uh, 12, 11 through 20, as heads of priestly houses. So these names represent heads of priestly families. They're not just signing for themselves, but for their entire households. As the same is probably also true of the other names. Yeah, these aren't just individual signatures when they sign something. They were signing on for their whole families. So yeah, these are kind of the big names in Israel among the, the priestly class. Now, verse 28 and following. We'll read 28 and 29. Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, 
their wives, their sons, their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding, they joined with their brother and their nobles and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments the Lord our, our God of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes. All right, so of course not everybody in Israel could sign, so the rest simply pledged themselves publicly to this covenant. Uh, in uh, this comment in verse 29, they entered into a curse and an oath. This is, this is actually what a covenant was. The, the ancient covenants, and you, you see this when God made his covenant with Abraham originally, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say make a covenant. and The language actually says to cut a covenant. You didn't make one, you cut one. And it was often done symbolically, and there's, it doesn't seem to have been the case here, but historically, when you cut a covenant, you cut an animal down the middle and laid the halves open. And as you would make your promise and pledge, you would walk between the halves of the animals. It was a bloody mess. And there's your, there is your, your, your oath and your curse. You are essentially promising, if you break the covenant, this is you know, your end. This is the bloody mess you earn by breaking a covenant. So sure is your word, so, so absolute is your promise that you're willing to put yourself on the line and say, if I don't keep it, this happens to me, kind of thing. So... Um, Cutting covenants was serious business. So when they talk about a curse and an oath, those were implicit in all ancient covenants. It's also a reminder of the language God uses uh, when he made his covenant originally through Moses with Israel. So if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 11, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 11. Verse 26 through 28. Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28. Uh, again, now this is God's language. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. So there is your blessing and your curse. As long as they keep their promise and follow God's word, he'll bless them. If they turn away from that word, they will be cursed. Stay in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. Deuteronomy Chapter 30, verse 15 to 20. See that I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So this, this blessing and curse thing happens twice here. One, with the giving of the law. Two, just as they're about to cross over and take possession of the promised land. What happens in Nehemiah is actually pretty much in line with that second point. God's people are once more possessing the Holy Land that God gave them. And you can hear, you, you can hear in, in what they're saying, that 
that they were listening when Ezra read God's word to them again. They hadn't heard it in generations. Ezra read God's word. He undoubtedly read these words from Deuteronomy. And they heard this blessing and cursing language as they were about to inherit the promised land, you know, generations ago. So here they adopt the same language, make the same pledge, because it's the same circumstance. God is bringing them back into the promised land and fulfilling his promise. After they had, of course, previously abandoned God and turned to, to false gods. So it's actually, a, the language is, uh, is very beautiful and connected to these ancient Ancient oaths. Any thoughts? Any comments? I have a question. It doesn't really pertain to that. <laughs> Bring it on. Uh, when when uh, the Jews and the Palestinians fight over the West Bank, was the West Bank part of the original Israel? I mean, was the West Bank part of the original promised land? I think so. You guys know? Or J? What West Bank was part of the original promise land, right? I think the same. Yeah. I think so. I have to look at a map, but I'm pretty sure it was. So what they're fighting over today goes back to the ancient thing. Yeah. All right. Yeah, why it why it matters, right? Okay. All right, one more note on the handout there, verse 29. They also say something else interesting here in 29. Uh, they, they talk about separating themselves. Um, let's see, where are we? Actually, verse 28, that is. Uh, all the, 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 the people, the rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, Nethanim, all those who had separated themselves from the people of the lands. This, this was another part of the ancient pledge Israel made to God when they entered the promised land, that they would separate themselves from the wicked. Now, originally in the promised land, that meant slaughtering all the wicked and chasing them out of the promised land. God did, in fact, command ancient Israel, when they went into the promised land, to, to kill everyone that was basically an idol worshiper, and drive them out so that the promised land would be a pure place where his children could live unencumbered by the false teachings of these other people. Now, that, that one little thing is often cited against Christianity by Islam. When Christians say that Islam uh, has a problem in that it talks about killing the unbeliever and striking their heads off and, you know, this kind of violent driving out of the unbeliever. And they always come back with saying, well, Christians are no different because God commanded in the Old Testament to kill all these people. But there's a big difference. The difference is, this was in an isolated geographical area, the promised land. And the reason for it was, was because... Again, with God, there's always another layer of meaning to things. The promised land was heaven. It was pointing to heaven, the purity of heaven, that where God would rule, where evil would be gone, where it would be this pure existence of faith and, and trust and you know, God there before you leading. In order, to, in, in order to make that understanding of heaven rightly understood they had to have a pure land. They never did, which is why they wound up finally being taken into slavery and lost as a people. With Islam, there is no symbol of heaven. There is no geographical area that was to be theirs. It's worldwide domination, plain and simple. They're not interested in cleansing a land. They're interested in purging the entire earth of anyone who's not Muslim. So, I mean, it's day and night. It is not the same. God has not commanded his believers to go out and kill all non-believers no matter where they find them. All right, so just, just to note that. They, well, they weren't Christians. They were, they were, in a way, in that they were looking forward to the Messiah coming and the Christ coming to save them. So in that sense, they were, they were Christians. They just didn't call themselves that or see themselves in those terms. But a Messianic Jew is a Christian. 
Yeah. All right. So back to it. Now the separation thing. Yeah, the separating themselves because Israel failed to separate themselves like they were told to when they originally inherited the promised land. They kept the unbelievers there. They mingled with them. They intermarried with them. They adopted their false gods. They corrupted themselves. And that's why they ultimately lost the promised land once before. So here you see a, a, a renewal of what should have been the first time around. This time they separate themselves. And that's significant. Uh, next verses. Actually, not next verse. Yeah, actually, let's look at the next verse and then come back on the handout. So verse 30 uh, that we would not give our daughters as wives to the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. And if the peoples of the land bring wares or grain or sell them on the Sabbath, we will not go out to buy it from them on the Sabbath uh, or on a holy day, and that we would forego the seventh year's produce and the exaction of every debt. So again, it's, this is more separation. They're not going to intermarry. They're not going to take the daughters of the, of the unbelievers, nor give their sons uh, into marriage, uh, let's see, nor sons, neither one. They're not going to intermarry with the unbelievers. Now, on the handout, what kind of application is there of this in the New Testament, particularly with us, this business of separating ourselves? To what extent do we take it? To what extent shouldn't we take it? There are actually two things in the New Testament that do speak of similar things. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, take a look at that. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 14 to 17. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols, for you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So the same language, be separate from the unbelievers. Uh, other citation is Romans chapter 16, verse 17. So take a look at that. Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. So similar language of separation also in the New Testament. Questions about this. Does this apply also to other Christians of a different confession? And to what extent? Are we supposed to be separate from everybody other than Lutherans? Other than Missouri Synod Lutherans at that. Thank you for that clarification. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 9 to 12. Is that the one? Oh, don't tell me. Oh, I meant 2 Corinthians. No longer. No wonder it didn't look right. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 12. I wrote you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly didn't mean the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since you would need to get a, uh, go out of the world. But now I have written you, do not keep company with anyone named a brother who's a fornicator or, a covetous, or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard nor an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside, but those who are outside God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. What does that verse say to that?
Okay. You're, you look at verse 11 in that first Corinthians, how can you be friends with anybody ever? Because we're all sinners. Yeah. I mean, it said, not keep company with any named your brother who is, and then it lists all of those. Yeah. Right. There's no one without sin. Is it just talking about just sin? And I think there's a persistence to this. It's, it's not just somebody who's done these things. It's somebody who's persisting in them and insisting on their right to, to be what they are. And, and again, what, to what extent does this apply to us? How do we, how do we express that? By being an example. By being an example. But there is, a, there is an element in this that can't be ignored that says to... Uh, to not even eat with them, the, the problem, to separate. The problem is that if you hang out with those type of people, being the sinful people, being that we are, we're going to, better or not, we're going to, we're going to lean toward what they're doing. Yeah, those type of people are us. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I mean, I mean, you try to separate your Yeah. There is something in the Proverbs about bad company corrupts good habits. You know, there is, there is that element of... My, my dad always told me, he said, you're known by the company you keep. There's something to that. <laughs> but what, to what extent, again? Um, well, they're leading you astray. Yeah. A lot of people have never had the chance to even know Jesus' name. Right. True. You're going to have, Jesus didn't come to save the people that were all great. He came to help the people that were messed up. Absolutely. So how are you going to get to them if you don't have contact with them? Yeah. Right? And he always went to the ones that were the worst. And he uses the people that nobody ever, ever would think of that he could use to teach. Now that's a, actually an interesting thing is if you apply that to Jesus... I mean, clearly, it's God's word, and he intends this for us, and, and, and there is, we need to apply this to ourselves. But if, if how, does, how does Jesus keep this? Clearly, Jesus wouldn't be at odds with God's word. So what is describing our lives should be like was, in fact, what Jesus' life was like. Did Jesus keep company with those who were named brother, who were fornicators, coveners, covetous, idolaters, revilers, drunkards, extortioners? And did he eat with them? Yes. He did. So what do you, again, what do you do with this? Clearly, Jesus did. You see, I, I, I don't think this text can be understood simply as identify the bad person and stay away from it. Because, you know, you're right, Pam, that, that we do have an obligation as Christians to bring Christ to them. And Christ himself did go to them. Uh, but he, he was in no way, shape, or form influenced by them. And when he went to them, it was for the purpose of saving them and turning them. In no way, shape, or form was it a participation with them. Nor did he in any way give his blessing on, on the lives they were leading. But this very thing did make the Pharisees extremely angry. You, you hear that repeatedly in the New Testament, how he, he goes with sinners and eats with them. And here Paul is even saying, don't even eat with them. But the, the, because eating is a sign in and of itself of, of intimacy, of closeness. So Jesus, Jesus ate with them, though, but to seek and save the lost, to convert, to change, to bring eternal life, to, 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 to get away from the life they were living. And I think what Paul is talking about here is more of a participation with them. Don't in any way, shape, or form give the impression that you're, you're okay with what they're doing, that you're participating in it, that, that, that it has your blessing in the any way, shape, or form. And I think that's what Paul is concerned about here. And Jesus did not do that. He didn't, he didn't in any way, shape, or form make it seem like what they were doing was okay. 
But it's difficult, and it's not always an easy question. To what degree do we associate with those who are godless? In ancient Israel, in Nehemiah's day, they separated themselves particularly in terms of marriage. They would still do business with them because it talks about doing business. They just wouldn't do business on the Sabbath. But they did separate themselves in a sense. They would not participate in the idolatry of these people. Yeah. Mess up. Sometimes we all mess up. Yeah. And the, the, the thing that actually precedes this statement in, Paul, uh, in Paul's 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is verse 6. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You know, a principle that's easy to forget. A little false teaching, that's the little leaven, corrupts the whole. A little false teaching can mess you up. And that's part of why Paul says don't associate with those. Don't in any way, shape, or form engage in this false teaching or permit it because it'll corrupt you. One bad apple yep, same principle. So, again, what is the practical application of that for us? It does not mean that we need to become Amish and have our own little community shut off from the rest of the world and only associate with those of our own. Uh, it, you know, it does not mean we can't be friends or friendly with those who even aren't Christian or are of confessions of faith that are false. It does, however, mean that when it comes to faith and worship, there is a separateness. Um, we as a church do not worship with those who confess falsely. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's, not, it's, it's often perceived as we're standoffish and think we're better than everybody else, but that's not it. What it is is this business of a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And God does tell us to mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine and avoid them. So you will not find us worshiping with churches where we know the confession is a, it has error or falseness in it. Uh, it's not in no way, shape, or form intended to be a we're holier than you people are statement. It simply is trying to maintain what God's word says, be separate where there's false teaching. And that's for the sake of preserving the flock and not letting that little leaven sneak in and start corrupting the whole lump. And well, how about marriage? That can be a little bit messy. <laughs> Boy, can it, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what about that? Well... Uh, it does mean a Christian should not marry an unchristian very clearly. Um, I believe it also means, though, that a couple needs to reconcile their faith differences, and they that it is that it is the best practice when both husband and wife are on the same page theologically, and that in fact it's not healthy in a marriage for there to be division theologically. So, you know, I do think even if a couple maybe doesn't start off both the, the same in their, their faith, that there does need, that does need to be reconciled for a healthy marriage. Simply agreeing to disagree is not a biblical concept when it comes to theology. So, you know, what back to kind of Nehemiah, what they were going through uh, does have certain applications to us and, and shouldn't just kind of be that's Old Testament doesn't really matter. It, it does. It's the same principles in the New Testament era, just maybe with little different applications. All right, any other thoughts before we press on? We got just a few more minutes. All right. Verse 30. Their promise, chapter 10, Nehemiah. Um, we read that. Wouldn't give their daughters. Also, 31, again, they're going to respect the Sabbath. <clears throat> Interesting that of all the, uh, all the ordinances and laws and everything, the one thing that gets mentioned is the Sabbath. They're going to respect the Sabbath, including even the Sabbath of years, in that every seventh year, um, 
they are not going to, it says they're going to forego produce. The, that means every seventh year was a Sabbath for the land. You couldn't plant and you couldn't reap. So all the farmers only had six years they could, they could do their work. Seventh year they had off. You couldn't even pick the wild stuff that you know, was growing because you didn't clean the field all that well the year before. It had to lay completely fallow the seventh year. And in addition to that, uh, it says the exaction of every debt. The other thing that happened on those, those Sabbath years were debts were forgiven. Uh, slaves were set free. It's like a reset button where everything goes back to, to its original status. So the Sabbath was a big deal for them. Again, why is that significant? Because the Sabbath is a Christological thing. The Sabbath, out of all the commandments they could be mentioning that they were going to go back to and keep in the way God intended, they focus on the Sabbath because ultimately that's Christ. Their promise rest would be found in the Messiah. You know, the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, as, as it says, uh, again, in the New Testament, let nobody judge you in meat, drink, new moon festivals, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. He is, he is the object of the Sabbath, the substance of it. The Sabbath is the shadow pointing ahead to Christ. So it's, it's interesting, again, that this is the one thing they focus on, and ultimately, it is Christ. It's a, it really shows their faith wasn't the law faith anymore. It was a messianic faith, which is saving faith. Verse 32 to 34. Uh, also, we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering of the Sabbaths, new moons, and set feasts, for the holy things, for sin offerings, to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. We cast lots among the priests, the Levites, the other people for bringing the wood offering into the house of our God according to our Father's houses at the appointed times year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God. It is written in the law. All right? Um, now, what, what about this? Because this is, this is man-made law now at this point. Verse 32, to an extent it is. Verse 32, we made ordinances for ourselves. Isn't it legalism to add laws to the laws God has given? Aren't they being kind of legalistic here? Uh, and if we, def if we define legalism in these terms on the handout here, the insistence on laws as a path to eternal life or the insistence of man-made laws as being as binding as God's laws, if that's how we define legalism, is that what this is? Are they talking about these laws they're making up as a necessary path to eternal life? No. Are they placing those laws on the same level as God's laws? Again, I don't necessarily think so. Why isn't this legalism? <laughs> yeah. It's... <laughs> Because it's a necessary and good thing for order and their continued worship of the right God. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with establishing orders and methods of doing things if it's for the purpose of promoting truth and protecting against error. Um, and that's kind of what they're doing here. This is for the continued right worship of God so that that never falls uh, aside again, or is never neglected again. So it's not, this isn't a law on par with God's law, and it's not a law they're making up just for the sake because they love laws. It's serving a necessary need, which is to maintain the house of God and the offerings and all of that. So it's not, in fact, legalism. Verse 35 to 38. Now, you'll notice in the English, what I think is an awful addition here. It says, and we made ordinances. You notice how we made ordinances and his italics? That means it's not part of the original Hebrew. 
That means the English translator just stuck it in there because they thought that's what it means. I don't think it's what it means. In fact, I think that's a bad addition because, it, again, it's, 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 it's saying these are man-made laws. And actually what follows in verse 35 are divine laws. These aren't laws they made. These are laws that harken back to the Old Testament that they heard Ezra read to them. So if you skip that part, it says, and to bring the first fruits of the ground and the first fruits of all the fruit trees year by year to the house of our Lord, to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle as it is written in the law. See, these are Old Testament laws. They're not making this up. And the firstlings of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God, to the priests who minister at the house of our God, to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the first fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine, the oil, to the priests, to the storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring tithes of our land to the Levites. Uh, for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities. Uh, this tithing thing, again, Old Testament law. They're not making this up. Every year, 10% of literally everything, every fruit tree on your land, every animal you have, all the income, the grain in your fields, 10% off the top, that was their tithe. And it all served, well, it served two purposes. I think it served the worship of God, and I think it also, they, they talk about the storerooms in the temple. I think on that seventh year when they couldn't do any farming, this was probably what they used to sustain themselves, too. And it came from God, which is another beautiful thing. The storerooms are part of the temple. So in the seventh year, when everything is fallow and they have no, no grain or anything, where do you go to be fed? To the temple. And, it, and it's God who feeds you in that year. You take a whole year off while, the, while you're being fed from the temple with every need you have. You know, it's, it's such beautiful imagery of grace. All right, we got to quit. Any thoughts, any comments? Nothing. All right. Let's close with a prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the grace that you give us this day, for opening up the storehouses of your mercy. We pray that you would keep us mindful of your constant gifts and blessings, that you would preserve us in these evil days, and bless us with eternal life for the sake of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.